Welcome to Copy Traders Club, where you can learn how to make more money copy trading. I am Gavin McCauley, my name and username on eToro. Today is a regular episode with me flying solo. Among other exciting things, this episode is where I first dip my toe into the muddy waters that are the risk score on eToro. Here we go. Episode 8, and today is a solo episode, divided, as usual, into three parts. Part 1, Behind the Scenes at Copy Traders Club. Part 2, Portfolio Update. Part 3, Risk. Ask, and ye shall receive. So Part 1, Behind the Scenes at Copy Traders Club. I thought I would give you a little peek behind the scenes here let you in on one or two things. Firstly, I'm delighted with how well this show is being received. I'm not so much referring to the numbers. I don't really have any idea what numbers would be considered good, bad or indifferent. And I'm not really bothered about that, for now at least. Starting this podcast, I simply wanted to make something good that added to the conversation. Something different to what was already out there and could be a source of interest and valuable content to copy traders and eToro enthusiasts. And to learn a few things myself. That all appears to be going to plan, and I've had some very warm encouragement from people whose opinions I respect, and whose positivity, will help make this podcast what I hope it can become. So my sincere thanks to those people, particularly all those who've agreed to be guests. Now, I have a friend who is, as Warren Buffett describes Charlie Munger, my abominable no man. My friend Roger is the one I know I can go to with any latest idea or proposal and he will pretty quickly deflate my balloon of enthusiasm with a few flatly delivered words of realism. It's a bummer to hear it, but it is, for the most part, healthy to keep in check some of one's more extreme flights of fancy. That Roger encouraged the idea of me doing a podcast without any real reservations was a bit of a surprise. That he had a few things to say when he had listened to the first four episodes was less of a surprise. So, over coffee, he offered his congratulations that the podcast was of acceptable audio quality interesting content, and a good atmosphere. Eventually, though, I gave him the green light he was waiting for to give it to me straight, like a pear cider that's made from 100% pears. Reference in the show notes. Two things, said Roger. Number one, the intro. It's too cheesy and your voice sounds too radio. Not real, not genuine. I'd been thinking the same thing, and I didn't like listening to it myself. But I'd been more keen to get started than to make everything totally polished. I didn't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. The worst beginner podcast mistake, they say, is to never actually publish. Tellingly, He asked if the intro was one of the first things I made after my equipment arrived. It was, and it sounded like it. I knew it, and he was right. Number two, he asked me why was I asking people in the conversation episodes if they were married and had kids. I answered, I have absolutely no idea and it feels weird. It doesn't really add anything. It's potentially way too personal an issue to probe, and I don't really care what the answer is. So why indeed? Those questions are no more, replaced by a much better and more relevant one. So those are a couple of changes. The intro will now be unique for each episode rather than a theme tune. It also teases what is coming up. I prefer that style of intro myself, so I'm happy with that change. Not sure whether I should go back and change all the intros or leave them as is as 
part of the journey. The thing is, people in the future, when they come to the show, they're going to start at the beginning. So they'll be listening to episode one and two and three and, you know, they say you never get a second chance to make a first impression. So I'll probably have to go back and revise those. Other changes will happen, no doubt, as the show matures and I get a better feel for what's working and what isn't. Good old Roger. He did give me an 8.5 to 9 out of 10 and stressed that those were minor tweaks to an otherwise decent effort. So, I will take that as a win. By the way, I'm churning out episodes at an unsustainable rate at the moment, only because I want to create a good starting foundation of content. I feel like I need to have about 20 episodes published before settling into a more acceptable rhythm for both creator and listener alike. So if you think the episodes are coming too thick and fast... I understand, but fear not, gentle listener, the birth rate will soon decline. Speaking of birth, I can track the birth of the podcast from a WhatsApp message I sent to Roger on the 5th of February, about two minutes after the light bulb moment. That was the conception. The moment of Rogering, you might say. The 10th of March was the launch slash birth. So a little over a month was the gestation period, including about eight days awaiting delivery of the equipment. It was a surprisingly painless birth. Must be thanks to my large hips. I knew they'd be useful one day. Coming up in part two, portfolio update. Part 2. Portfolio Update. No big changes to my portfolio. If you've listened to the previous episode, you know I have no intention of adding or removing any PIs or getting involved in assets beyond copying PIs, at least for the time being. So nothing to report on that front. I am keen to explore copy portfolios more, but that's for another time. I did add in early March to my amount invested. I know that will skew my March result in a way I don't yet fully understand, really. But then, in April, the results will resume a more accurate meaning. What I can see is how my PIs did in the month of March, when many investors and PIs were suffering some negative figures. While my main man, Samosa King, is down 5%, and to a lesser extent, trade better, is down at just as smidge under 5%. Both my other two guys are up. Robert Merck is up a healthy 7.5% and Elite Vol is up by a whopping 12.4%. Ultimately, my March stat shows me just finishing in the green. I don't particularly care about that since one month stats are not something I will allow myself to get either too excited or dismayed about. I aim to meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. On a monthly basis, as Kipling didn't add. What is encouraging is to see that not all PIs showed the same movement. That encourages me that there's a degree of balance there. Robert's diversified asset classes and nimbleness, combined with elite vols outperformance, during a time of increased volatility, at least on a sector-by-sector basis, helped keep the ship stable through what many considered some choppy waters. Nothing much else to add. Oh, I did make a little change to my bio following the moth copy trading episode. After hearing Stephen talk about how his decision-making has been influenced by the fact that he now has copiers, I don't think I would be influenced in this way, but I wanted to spell that out, so my bio now reads, Copy Traders Club podcast in the usual places. I am not seeking copiers. I won't consider any copiers when making decisions. Smiley face. I am just trying to work out how to copy trade as best I can. 
many happy returns. The smiley face means I'm not being nasty, just that my account will be managed only with me in mind. I have zero copiers now and I'm happy for that number to never change. Although there may be people who listen to the show and decide to copy me. I can't stop them, I suppose. Can you? That should be a feature. In any case, I won't bear them in mind when making decisions. It's hard enough to know what the right thing to do for oneself is, without any added pressure. Coming up in part three is the big one. Risk and the risk score on eToro. Hey, hope you're enjoying today's show. I'm sure you've subscribed already. If you're a successful copy trader, happy to share what you've learned. There's no need to have a public profile. Please get in touch. Otherwise, listener, the bigger the club, the better for you. So tell people on eToro about this show. Ask your PIs to come on. That way you will get to know them better. We build this club together. Part 3. Risk and the Risk Score on eToro In my short time on eToro, I have watched as others learned that a PI's risk score is based not upon the value column of their portfolio, but on the PI's originally invested column. I've heard many complain that this revelation shocks and disappoints them. They ask, how can the risk score mean anything if it doesn't reflect the nature of a PI's current portfolio, but only reflects their risk at the time they entered the position? That might have been a year ago. Link in the show notes to the relevant Felix Falix video. In this part of today's show, I'm not going to argue on behalf of a change to this or any other revision as to how the risk score is put together. I am but a humble copy trader, and, dear listener, ours not to reason why, ours but to do and die. All we can do is understand fully what it is, rather than lead a charge for its change. There may be solid reasons why it is the best stat, that can be provided, and why it won't change. So, surely a better use of our energy is to ask what it is and what it isn't, and then to conclude what to do about it. So what is risk? That seemingly stupid question actually reveals that risk, in this context, or in any context, can mean different things to different people. The answer is very different depending on whether you're a wealthy older person with a huge amount in your portfolio or a young guy aiming to multiply his first $1,000 or a 38-year-old single mum trying to create a steady passive income stream. So that in itself is a big issue. Let's just say for today that the risk we mean is the risk of losing money. To begin making notes on this section, I opened up possibly my favourite investing book, The Most Important Thing, by Howard Marks, an absolute treasure trove of wisdom. Before I got to any of his great quotes on risk, I note chapters 5, 6 and 7 are about risk. Here is his opening paragraph to chapter 5. Investing consists of exactly one thing, dealing with the future. And because none of us can know the future with certainty, risk is inescapable. Thus, dealing with risk is an essential, I think the essential, element in investing. It's not hard to find investments that might go up. If you can find enough of these, you'll have moved in the right direction. But you're unlikely to succeed for long if you haven't dealt explicitly with risk. The first step consists of understanding it. The second step is recognising when it's high. The critical final step is controlling it. Because the issue is so complex and so important, I devote three chapters to examining risk in depth. So the most important thing to note from that is that risk is the most important thing in the most important thing. 
and is a huge subject. So let's begin from that starting point. Risk is too big a topic to think that a single mark out of 10 can tell the whole story. Nice of eToro to try to simplify such an issue. But frankly, the risk score on eToro is likely nothing more than an indicator. If you're using the risk score as a definitive metric of the exact risk of copying a PI, that is, I would suggest, an inadequate approach. But we'll come back to that later. Let's get more from Howard Marks as he considers the key element for us today, measuring risk. He talks about how the most important question is, how do investors measure risk? Quotes, first, it clearly is nothing but a matter of opinion. Hopefully an educated, skillful estimate of the future, but still just an estimate. Second, the standard for quantification is non-existent. With any given investment, some people will think the risk is high and others will think it's low. Some will state it as the probability of not making money and some as the probability of losing a given fraction of their money and so forth. Some will think of it as the risk of losing money over one year and some as the risk of losing money over the entire holding period. Clearly, even if all the investors involved met in a room and showed their cards, they'd never agree on a single number representing an investment's riskiness. And even if they could, that number wouldn't likely be capable of being compared against another number set by another group of investors for another investment. This is one of the reasons why I say risk and the risk return decision aren't machinable or capable of being turned over to a computer. Ben Graham and David Dodd put it this way more than 60 years ago in the second edition of Security Analysis, the Bible of Value Investors. The relation between different kinds of investments and the risk of loss is entirely too indefinite and too variable with changing conditions to permit of sound mathematical formulation. Third, risk is deceptive. Conventional considerations are easy to factor in, like the likelihood that normally recurring events will recur. But freakish, once-in-a-lifetime events are hard to quantify. The fact that an investment is susceptible to a particularly serious risk that will occur infrequently, if at all, what I call the improbable disaster, means it can seem safer than it really is. The bottom line is that, looked at prospectively, much of risk is subjective, hidden, and unquantifiable. So Marx is saying, risk assessment requires the application of human intellect, not a qualitative algorithm. So is the eToro risk score to be taken merely as an indicator? We must know how the risk score is arrived at, to understand what it is and what it isn't. Let's take a look at everything that eToro are telling us about risk score. This is all easily viewable information. As mentioned, many people complain about the risk score. Mostly they are annoyed when they find out what the risk score means because it doesn't tally with what they had assumed it meant. Better to check and then there will be no incorrect assumption on your part. The annoyance won't arise if you ask the right questions first. I'll be honest, my assumption when I signed up for eToro was that here I was on this cutting edge fintech platform and I bet their risk or algorithm has all sorts of fancy elements to it beyond my knowledge. But it somehow is showing me how much risk it would mean to start copying this trader, as of today, based on what he owns and its price today, and how risky each asset is, which itself is probably based on some whiz-bang algorithm beyond my understanding too. I wonder, did you, perhaps even subconsciously, think something similar?
On a PI stat page, you will find the 12 month bar chart of risk. You know where I mean. Each colored bar shows the average monthly risk score, and there is a thin horizontal line for each bar indicating the max risk score touched in that month. It also tells you the average risk score in the last seven days, and there are some figures for max drawdown. Okay, so far so good. But the key feature is the small blue information icon, a lowercase letter i in a circle. Hover your mouse over that or tap it on your mobile and the explanation of the risk score appears as follows. The risk score formula includes the total allocation of the user's portfolio, the leverage they are using, the overall volatility of the markets they trade and the correlation between them. The risk score is calculated using a special formula we've developed right here in eToro. The score is calculated for each user from 1 to 10, where 1 is the lowest possible risk and 10 is the highest possible risk. Please visit this blog post explaining how the risk score is calculated. That links to a blog post dated 2nd June 2014, which has been viewed about 63,000 times. 20 million users, remember? 63,000 times. Key parts of the blog post are The principle behind the risk score is very simple. We want you to be able to assess the exact risk you're taking on with every trading decision, including copy trading. Not just get a feel of the risk, but actually be able to measure it with cold hard numbers. The risk score will provide you with an overall portfolio risk score, as well as a breakdown of what this risk is made up of. This will be available for view on all our members' profiles, which means it's not only your own profile you'll be able to better analyze, but everyone else's. When it comes to copy trading, any new trader that you copy will impact your risk score based on the way the trader you copy behaves, their choice of instruments, their choice of leverage, the percentage of their equity that is invested on a single instrument. All these and more are taken into account in the algorithm we have employed. When combining all the data together, we are able to calculate with a great degree of accuracy the risk a specified trader brings to your portfolio. So basically, you'll be better able to assess any trader you want to copy, since you will be able to not only see his or her gain and performance, but also understand the risk he or she is taking. Now, as I say, I did not read all of this very carefully before setting up my portfolio. Pretty sure I glanced at it, but I certainly didn't read it the way I have done preparing for this episode. I should have. I just want to go back over some of the wording here. The blog post says the principle behind the risk score is very simple. We want you to be able to make, we want you to be able to assess the exact risk. Well, it's hardly the exact risk. The risk score will provide you with an overall portfolio risk score, as well as a breakdown of what this risk is made up of. Really? Where, where is the breakdown of what the risk is made up of? And then it goes on to say what the risk score is based on. Okay, let's go through those. The way the trader you copy behaves is the first metric. Well, it measures the way they behaved, past tense, when they entered into the positions. If they bought Tesla as 10% of their profile and they sat on their hands until it is now 90% of the value column of their portfolio, that behavior is absent from the risk score. Next one is their choice of instruments. What does this mean? Some instruments are riskier than others. Sure. Do they consider ETFs less risky than stocks? Do they differentiate between stocks? Is Berkshire Hathaway given the same risk score as NEO? There's no further information on that. Next is their choice of leverage, meaning if they use leverage or not, 
What about leveraged ETFs or other creative leverage methods? Currency traders use leverage more than equity investors generally, yet there are currency traders with exceptionally low risk scores. So there must be some nuance in the way the risk associated with leverage is gauged, but there's no information on that. Next, the percentage of their equity that is invested on a single instrument. Okay, that's fair enough. If they put all or most of their money on one position, but again, it's only at the time that they buy. So if we think again of the Tesla example, that doesn't come into it if Tesla has risen to become a huge proportion of their equity. And also, what happens to the traders such as volatility traders who may only ever have one or two instruments in use? And they therefore must necessarily take up a large amount of the portfolio. Is there any allowance made for them? Final point, all these and more are taken into account. It would be nice to know what the more is. The final paragraph says, when combining all the data together, we are able to calculate with a great degree of accuracy the risk a specific trader brings to your portfolio. Well, I mean, when they become part of your portfolio, they're bringing with them their current mindset and their current positions vis-a-vis -vis their current positions, if you know what I mean. That's what they're bringing, and that's determined by the invested column, the current status of everything that's in their portfolio. So they go on to say, basically, you'd be better able to assess any trader you want to copy, and you can understand the risk he or she is taking. Again, keep using the present tense. So that's quite interesting that uh, some of my assumptions turned out to be correct. There's quite a few elements of the risk score that were what I thought when I was on this brand new whiz-bang fintech platform. But there's still plenty of holes. Going through this wording raises as many questions as it answers. And if I was eToro, I would work on this page. So where does that leave us? As copy traders, we cannot be expected to go into granular detail on each position of every PI and calculate its intrinsic value, assess what the PI has taken into consideration, entering that position and the level of risk it involves today to copy that position. Copy trading is supposed to be a shortcut. So what will I do? Well, a few things, I suppose. Look at the risk score as a beginning guide. It means something, and it's maybe of more use as a relative guide when comparing one PI to another at a glance. But I'm going to remind myself that without further investigation, it's of limited significance. Secondly, I'm going to look at the value column before copying and ensure it's not way out of sync. That's critical. I'm going to look through the assets held. If it's an equity investor, I'm going to look at the nature of the assets. Are they all hot stocks? Is there diversification among asset classes and instruments? I'm also going to look to see evidence that the PI is actively managing risk in the portfolio. What sort of hedging tactics do they employ? Are they always fully invested or is there cash on hand? And finally, are they consistent in their approach or do they change with the weather? What am I missing? I'm sure there's several other things. Please let me know. I have less of an idea how to assess the risk of a PI who trades in assets other than stocks, like my two smaller PIs, a commodities slash currency trader and a volatility trader. Hopefully they'll be on the podcast soon and can give us some guidance. But that's for another day. And this is where today's episode ends. Risk and the risk score are big issues facing copy traders. If you see any glaring errors or omissions in today's episode, please let me know because it's a subject I want to understand as much as possible. 
Coming up in the next episode, we have a man who needs no introduction. So, I will let him speak for himself. Hello, this is Andrew Haddon, otherwise known as Felix Felix and Etoro. Welcome to the number one Etoro-based YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. Until next time we meet at Copy Traders Club, I wish you many happy returns. Obviously, anything you hear in this podcast is for entertainment only, not financial advice. Do your own research. This is just generic chit chat. We don't know your individual circumstances, etc., etc., and so forth. <laughs>